Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome. This is episode number 120 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we look back at uh, flight training. Now, flight training you might not have thought about during World War II, and that involved Embry-Riddle University. We'll find out more in just a moment. But before we get started tonight, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, make sure you click that bell icon and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when they get posted. So joining me now from Embry-Riddle is Dr. Stephen Kraft. Dr. Kraft, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Tell us a little bit about uh, you and and your background. Well, I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Security Studies and International Affairs at, at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach. Uh, that's where we have a Homeland Security and Intelligence degree and another degree. And But my background actually is, is more about Asia. I was in Asia for many years. Uh, and so, and I do uh, a lot of publication on that. But uh, many years ago, I was asked to join a task force to look at the history of Embry-Riddle and ultimately that's what led to my publishing a book about uh, Embry-Riddle and aviation training during World War II. Wow, <laughs> so it's a uh, really a deep dive into a, a very tight uh, period of history. So let's uh, let's get to it. This is uh, 1939 to 1945 and you know Embry-Riddle is, is famous for for training pilots uh, these days but uh, it goes way back doesn't it? Yes, it does. In fact, it all it goes back to the 1920s, and that's really where we have to start. Uh, is looking at the the, the founders of Embry-Riddle, which would be uh, T. Higby Embry and John Paul Riddle, the namesakes, and they remain the namesakes of, of the institution. And it actually goes back to again to the 1920s. Uh, Embry is the gentleman in the very center of this photograph. We don't know very much about him other than he came from a very wealthy family in Kentucky. I think they owned cattle. And during World War I, he was a balloonist. And um, after the war, he became basically a bus line magnate. John Paul Riddle is standing to his left. And John Paul Riddle, born and raised in Pikeville, Kentucky. If you're from that area, uh, it would be pronounced Pikeville. But uh, from a very early age, he wanted to be a pilot and got into the Naval Academy, but as a plebe, learned from the Commandant that once he completed four years at the Naval Academy, he would be sent to Pensacola, and there he would train in lighter than air. And Riddle did not want lighter than air, he wanted to fly heavier than air. And so, he, in his plebe uniform, he leaves the Academy, goes down to Washington, D.C., goes to the Army Air Service office, and says, I want to join the Army Air Service. And they said, sorry, uh, this year's class has already gone through, but if you're willing to do so, we will send you to Texas and there you will learn to become a mechanic. And that's what he does. And he said that was actually the best uh, decision that he ever made in his life because before he learned to be a pilot, he learned everything he needed to know about the aircraft itself, engines and wings, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the highlights of his life was uh, Jimmy Doolittle did a, um, a, a flight from um, basically Jacksonville to San Diego, making a stop at this uh, Army airfield in Texas. And John Paul Riddle got to service his plane and uh, took photographs and, and, and kind of maintained some, type of a, some kind of a connection with Jimmy Doolittle until they both passed away. That's a, a fascinating story, and it, it, especially in the early days of aviation, some of the, the pioneers, their paths crossed. And uh, a while back, I just remember the story, we had uh, Jimmy Doolittle's granddaughter on, uh, Jonna Hops, and she talked about that flight and landing in Texas. And 
now a year later, <laughs> finding out that uh, he was the man who who serviced uh, Jimmy Doolittle's airplane on that cross country flight. It's it, it, again, it's just one of those amazing things that that happens in aviation history. Is as all these pioneers, their paths just all seem to cross and, and intersect at one point or another. Exactly, and 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 it made it made an impression on, on John Paul Riddle. Uh, as sure. I say, um, I, I, there's a long letter that he wrote to Doolittle in the 1980s, and, and he talked about his admiration for Doolittle and, and how that was an inspiration to him um, as he himself w was training ultimately to be an Army Air Service pilot. So he begins his training. He is sent to Florida. He's trained at uh, Carlstrom Airfield in Arcadia, Florida, and um, he, go he does his primary maybe some basic, I can't remember, and ultimately he has to go back to Texas to Kelly Field and complete his uh, training. And then the decision he has, he's going to make a decision. Do I stay in the Army Air Service or do I pursue uh, flight as, as profit? And like Charles Lindbergh, that's ultimately what he decides to do. He will keep a commission uh, in the Army Air Service uh, until maybe 1940. Uh, but at any rate, he decides I'm going to become a barnstormer, and that's what he does. He goes to, back to Kentucky. He goes to Ohio. That's where he met Embry. He goes to California. And he's barnstorming, but the California market was saturated with pilots, and so he goes back to Ohio, and these two get together, and one key aspect to John Paul Riddle was he was never the money man, and he was always in need of finding someone who had the money. Embry had the money, and so they decided on the anniversary of their first Wright flight, uh, 1925, to form what becomes known as the Ember Riddle Company, and it's formed in Lincoln, Ohio, at Lincoln Airfield, and this is the old office. Um, again, this is probably 1925, 1926, and when they first started out, they were simply not, they were not in the, in the business to just train pilots. They basically became like a, a, an aircraft dealer. And they started out trying to sell Waco aircraft. The Weaver, these are aircraft produced by the Weaver Aircraft Company of Troy, Ohio. Uh, as one of our graduates used to, at the Smithsonian would say, uh, he can remember how to pronounce Waco because he, know, he knows that Waco is a, is a city in Texas, Waco is a state of mind, and Waco is an aircraft. And um, they, they were hoping that they could tap into a market and people would want to learn to fly, but didn't get off to a good start. In fact, one day, according to John Paul Riddle, uh, Embry walked up to him and gave him some money and he said, what's this? He said, well, I just bought one of our planes and that's your half. So, but eventually they, the, the market does take off, but, but in 1926 they decide, all right, we're going to get into the business of flight training. But here's a picture of John Paul Riddle flying in his white Waco aircraft. That aircraft still exists about 10 or years ago or so. Uh, a, local, a gentleman that lives locally um, ended up with this aircraft and he came to Riddle and um, we checked John Paul Riddle's flight log and we determined that the aircraft that he was flying or he possessed was at one point John Paul Riddle's plane. I've seen the plane, looks really, really nice, uh, but at any rate, that plane still exists. So we begin our flight training, and it's going to be comparable to what you would see in World War II. The, uh, the, the pilot, would, the instructor would be in the front. The, the student would be in the rear of the aircraft. And you have your ground school. You're going to have to learn, obviously, everything that goes with uh, engines and, 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 and fuselages and wings and so forth. But that wasn't enough. Um, the company needed to find a way to make money. And... Uh, it benefited from uh, the Republicans of the 1920s, who not only are going to be focused on bringing order to, to uh, aviation, uh, because they were concerned about all the barnstorming and the impact it would have, and it maybe would just uh, keep people away from airplanes. And so the, the government is going to eventually, by 1928, 1929, is going to have very stiff rules and regulations, and it's going to demand that flight schools basically be accredited. And one of the first five of that went through that process in the late 1920s was in Brittle. But also the Republicans wanted to find a way to have the air, basically mail delivered uh, to cities around the country using private owners. 
And depending on your route, they could pay you maybe they started out maybe maybe paying two or three dollars for every pound that you would carry. And a bid came up to fly a route from Cincinnati, Chicago, via Indianapolis. We bid it for the route. We got it. And it was called CAM 24, <clears throat> Civil Aviation uh, Mail Route Number 24. We get that. And we began to fly mail. And you can see here's one of our biplanes getting some mail to, to be flown up to Chicago. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, John Paul Rillo eventually had a, a rule that everyone in the company had to parachute out of an airplane. But he also, uh, based on personal experience, ordered all of the pilots to, that were flying the mail to carry a parachute because he flew to Chicago one time and it was it clouded in and he's over the lake, over Lake Michigan. And he and finally he, got, he saw a spot in the sky, was able to land the plane. And from that point on, he, he wished he had had a parachute at that point. And he, he basically tells the pilots, all right, from now on, you're going to wear a parachute uh, for safety reasons. Um, clearly, we could not always fly uh, passengers in the wintertime. As you can see from this photograph, there's snow. This would have been a very rare event because usually in December, January, there was no carrying of passengers for obvious reasons. These are open cockpit aircraft. There are no such things as heaters and things like that. And so um, we would just have to simply cancel uh, passenger aircraft until the weather improved. But um, here's another one of our aircraft. Eventually, we do acquire a Ford tri-motor. I've flown in one of these, uh, not very comfortable, but um, it, it was obviously a much better aircraft than flying in a uh, open cockpit biplane. And I can't remember exactly how many seats were in these things when I flew in one, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, maybe 30 people, maybe a few more. And uh, so obviously it's an all metal aircraft, but uh, this is gonna be one of our, our uh, one of our aircraft that we're gonna use on a regular basis. There was another all metal aircraft that was produced at Lunkin Field. There weren't that many produced. It was called the Flamingo. And um, not that many passengers, but this is another all metal aircraft that we could use. Uh, this is a time when there was no such thing as a transceiver. The, there would be a radio in the cockpit, but the pilot could only hear the tower. The pilot could not talk back to the tower. Uh, so the tower may see the plane coming in and say, okay, is that embryo number five? And it, it, they would either say, you know, turn on your lights or waggle your wings or something to let the tower know that she, that's you. It's kind of interesting. At one point, the company even in, looked into the idea of, using carrier pigeons as a form of communication when they were flying back and forth. And it didn't work, but um, it, it just showed what they were thinking about. What can we do to communicate uh, with others as we're uh, carrying on our business? Unfortunately, 1929, there's the Great Depression. And the company is not making enough money. And it considered being bought out or merging with Sherman Fairchild uh, Fairchild loved Embrutal because um, we had done a lot of work for the company. Uh, you know, as you probably are well aware, Fairchild produced a lot of uh, uh, cameras for aircraft to take photographs of fields and, and, and very much how we use UAVs today. And our students had the opportunity to fly in these planes and and take photographs of all these farm fields, so you would know exactly where they would uh, these the the boundaries and all that. And he goes to New York and he's thinking he's going to find a way to merge with Embrutal. But instead, um, it's a group by the name of Lehman Brothers and Averill Harriman who make a decision that, no, we're going to buy you out. And you really can't see it very clearly on this slide. But um, basically, there's like nine flight schools that all got bought out at the same time. And that became American Airways. And for a brief time, Embrittle was called the Embrittle Division of American Airways. But by that point, we lost CAM 24. I think we were flying to St. Louis and other places. Uh, and so at any rate, for a brief time, we are a part of, of American Airways. Uh, T. Higby Embry is out. He moves to California. He is no longer involved in aviation that we know of. He passes away at an early age after the war. John Paul Riddle, leaves as well. Uh, C.R. Smith, who owned American Airlines, wanted him to stay with the company. 
Uh, we've got letters in our archive that pretty much uh, John Paul Riddle told him directly, I think you're a crook. I think you're a shyster. I don't want any part of it. So uh, Riddle has got his stock from Waco Aircraft, from <clears throat> American Airways. He goes to New York, and then ultimately he comes back to Florida. And it's there that once again, he tries to find a money guy, found one or two, nothing really took off. But uh, 1939, he's going to get lucky in a couple of different ways. Um, there is already a war in China, and there, is, there are war clouds on the horizon in Europe. And there will soon be a war in, uh, in September of 1939. So John Paul Riddle is in Miami. And he's trying to find a money guy, and he finds it in the form of John McKay, uh, a lawyer who used to practice in Indi uh, Indianapolis, um, who was a, an avid race car fan, um, knew Eddie Rickenbacker personally. And he had been convinced uh, by the gentleman who built Miami to move to Miami. And so Riddle and McKay partner together, and the Ember Riddle Company is reborn in Miami a very tiny operation, maybe a couple of pilots, maybe a couple of mechanics, two or three planes, and it's reborn in Miami uh, on the causeway. Um, this is before it became known as MacArthur Causeway. And today there's not much left of it. There's some type of uh, um, entertainment event or something on this, on, on this part of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the causeway where we were located. Uh, so there's nothing much left there, but you can see um, Miami is in the background. And we started out flying a Piper a J3 Cubs as seaplanes. And so we've got a seaplane base and we offer flight training to anyone who shows up. And there will be a number of different people. For example, Lawrence Olivier, the, um, the famous actor, uh, spent some time getting a water rating uh, for one, well, with us. So uh, this is how we're training young men and women if they're interested in paying for private flight training. Here you can see our, our seaplanes. And uh, this is how we would have to back the fuel truck down the ramp and, and fill up the plane. And, and then the students can go and, and do their training. Um, and again, we're getting people from all over the world. There was young, some young guy from Hong Kong who wanted to fly in the RAF. He came here. Uh, in, to Miami and um, at least got his private pilot's license and then he went off to Canada hoping he could go fly for the RAF. I have no idea what happened with the rest of his story, but that was just one of the few students that was with us. Um, so it's a tiny operation, but that's still not enough. And we got, we got, we got lucky. Uh, and and we, we were fortunate with our location because in 1938, because uh, or um, because we could see the war was on the horizon, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted to have a program by which we could train um, men and women thinking about down the road: Are we going if we're going to be ending up in a war? Are we going to have enough pilots available? And uh, but this would be a program that would go through universities. It would not be necessarily through uh, just a, the private company. Um, the president of the University of Miami lived in Coral Gables, was John Paul Riddle's uh, uh, neighbor. His name was Bowman Ash, and for years he'd been trying to get a contract with the U.S. government to provide some type of flight training. And he gets this. He's able to get uh, become part of the civilian pilot training program. The University of Miami would provide the ground school, and Riddle would provide the, the flight training itself. So now we're, we're, we're doing two different things. We're doing uh, training under civilian pilot training program in which students are getting a scholarship. But if they don't make it in that program, they, but they still wanna be a pilot, we will tell them, okay, we can still train you, but it'll be on this side. And, and obviously you're gonna be paying with your money. So uh, this meant that we're gonna to have to expand and we're going to have to move to Municipal Airport. We're going to keep our seaplane base. That's not going to go away, but we're going to have to open up a ground, have a, a, a land-based uh, uh, airport that we can work out of. Um, and so we've got two different operations going on, seaplane base along the causeway and at Municipal Airport. Still kind of a tiny operation, 
primarily relying on uh, Piper J3 Cubs. Piper himself and his son would fly these things all the way down from Pennsylvania and deliver them in person. Um, and and the, the reason why most people in those days preferred a Piper for fl flight training was because they were so cheap and when it came to maintenance compared to other aircraft. So um, we're going to expand, and, and here's another field in Miami that we used briefly, uh, Master Field. Unfortunately, we lost this in 1943. The Navy is going to take over this in the middle of the war, um, and, and we're going to have to we're going to be uh, we're going to be forced to do our flight training elsewhere. But we began to grow very quickly uh, because we're training uh, students for all these different programs. And um, it became clear to us that. We just simply didn't need to, just to train people to be pilots. Uh, there were other aspects of aviation that needed um, people, uh, mechanics, radio operators, and so forth. And there was a building that had been built in 1925. It was supposed to be a hotel. It was never fully completed. Um, and it, it was known to locals as the White Elephant. I can't remember the streets, but and it doesn't exist. It was torn down in 1973. Uh, but this was basically our main administration building from about 1940 until uh, the early 1960s when we moved to Daytona Beach. And, uh, <clears throat> and there will be times we'll be kicked out of this building uh, by the military during the war. But we were going to, and, and there was another, uh, at one point, there was some guy who owned chickens uh, that, had offices in this building and so the whole building became known as the chicken coop. So we take over this building and we're going to be providing uh, training to men and women, uh, welding and things like that. Um, and so uh, this is going to become a, kind of like our main administration uh, uh, building. Also because of the war in Europe and in Asia, uh, Roosevelt turned to Hap Arnold who was now uh, chief of the um, Army Air Corps at this point, and said, look, we, we need to be thinking about producing pilots for the military. Uh, we've got Kelly Field, we have one other, but they can only produce so many hundreds of, of students per year. There's, there's a limitation. What can we do to solve the problem? Arnold remembered World War I, in which the military turned to civilian contractors and those contractors would produce the pilots. And so a call was put out uh, in 1939 and the original cut, well, I think was to produce either 3,500 students a year or 7,500 a year. And it's going to grow. Um, by 1943, there was talk about producing as many as 90,000 pilots a year, maybe 120, but we never needed to produce that many pilots. So Arnold will put out a call and there will be seven contractors who will get the contract. Riddle was not one of those. He regretted not getting a contract. Um, and um, one was in Chicago, one was in Nebraska, and one was in St. Louis and it's gonna stay there for the entire war. It became untenable for obvious reasons. You're in Nebraska, you're in Chicago, it's going to be very cold, you're flying open cockpit aircraft. And so in, so in 1940, when the, the, the military put out a call for a second group of contractors, one of the stipulations it made was that all flight training would occur below what the 37th parallel. Uh, during the war, the Army Air Force called this the Sunshine Belt. Uh, so with the exception of the flight training in St. Louis, uh, the school in Chicago, the school in Nebraska, one goes to Georgia, one moves to Florida. Uh, and, and so uh, all flight training is supposed to occur in this area. John Paul Riddle put in a bid, he got a contract, and he remembered Carlstrom Field and, and all that. And so he goes back there. The people of Arcadia, they're happy to have him because they've been wanting to get into aviation. Uh, they get an architect from Miami. He comes up, he designs this airfield. Um, and uh, one of the things, because John Paul Riddle was huge when it came to athletics, he was big into that. He's going to insist that there be basketball courts, tennis courts, and a swimming pool. 
And uh, these were very nice facilities. Um, um, basically, you had three or four cadets that have their own room, have their own shower and all that. Uh, I haven't been here since 2002 uh, when I was there. And this is all before Hurricane Charlie came through in 2004. But when I was there, um, all these buildings were, for the most part, still standing. But they, obviously, they were beginning to fall apart. But the hangars were still there, but they were on a high security prison. And um, so at any rate, and it's interesting, uh, this, this actually after the war, this actually became a mental health facility and it closed just a couple of years before I, I, I went there in 2002. So anyway, um, uh, this field is, is, is our first field that we're going to um, utilize uh, for the purposes of flight training. And we knew right away we needed another field. And uh, so we went to another uh, old World War I field just down the road, um, about seven or eight miles away from uh, Carlstrom, the old door field. And we, they, 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 we get the same architect, but he does a little bit different design. It's more of a kind of a diamond shape um, <clears throat> and so forth. But you can see the, the fields, you can very clearly see the swimming pool. Uh, I don't, I was there in 2002. I don't, I think that may, there may be, there was one building left. And for a long time, this was also a high security prison, but I think this is completely closed today, but uh, I'm not sure. So <clears throat> these are our first two fields and we're going to be flying, a, a training two cadets uh, of the Army Air Corps. And each cadet is uh, there'll be, or each instructor typically are, will train five cadets and we're going to be using uh, PT-17 Stearman aircraft at our fields in Karlstrom and Door. And again, it's a situation in which the instructor sits in the front, the, uh, the cadet sits in the, in the back. Uh, there, there are only two ways to communicate. There was the Gosport that was uh, developed by the British, and that's where the the instructor talks through a, a little microphone, or and, and there's a you can see on this cadet's head there's a, like a receiver goes in his ear. That was one way to communicate, and the other would be through hand signals. Um, there was an instructor I in interviewed many years ago who said that when he got into the plane, he would put the words on the back of his helmet, "Relax," and uh, so you you try to keep your cadets calm. And, and you, you try to train them as best as you can until eventually they solo and, 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 and so forth. So all the, the training that we provide at Carlstrom and uh, Dorfield is primary and they go off the basics somewhere else. Here you can see more clearly the, in, the instructor using the, the Gosport device. It's not gonna be until 1945 that the Army Air Force begins to put radios uh, in these planes so that the cadet and the instructor could have better communication uh, instead of just using this device. Uh, also, the instructors would probably put a mirror uh, somewhere up here so they could actually see their cadet. And, um, uh, and there was one occasion which uh, the instructor was not happy with the way in which the cadet was spinning the aircraft. And basically the instructor took control of the plane put it through a spin to show the cadet how to do it properly and looked up in his mirror and the cadet was gone and he rolled the plane over and a parachute popped open. And what happened was, and this was a, this was a common problem, uh, the cadets would forget to buckle up. And, and even though we would put up signs reminding them they would forget. And the reason why the, the cadet was flying the plane or putting in the spin in a certain way was because he knew he might get pitched out of the plane. And there's no way for him to really to tell that to his instructor. Um, this happened on another occasion. The instructor came back all alone and he said, I lost my boy. Uh, so anyway, um, fortunately, no one died. We never lost a cadet in that type of condition. But from time to time, this, 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 is, this does happen. Well, John Paul Riddle is in the UK. He is watching the Royal Air Force in action. And the word just comes in that Japan has attacked the United States of Pearl Harbor. And so John Parrill becomes very driven, comes back and is gonna really dedicate the entire uh, company to, uh, to the war effort. And the technical school is gonna be a key part of that uh, for different reasons. Again, we're not only training pilots, 
We're training people to be mechanics, to be welders and, and, and radio operators, and they're gonna go off and do all kinds of different occupations uh, during the war. Uh, some of them directly related to, to the military, some of them indirectly. Uh, the old civilian pilot training program is going to come to an end and it's going to be replaced by the War Training Service. I'll talk about that in a second. But also the Army Air Forces decided to establish a training detachment at uh, our main administration building. And the original purpose was to train uh, mechanics, though I know that there were a few of these guys, even though they did all their training here, they actually became tail gunners for a B-17 or a B-24. So not everyone that was trained here to be a mechanic ended up being a mechanic. Um, but basically you train them to, to, you teach them how to maintain aircraft. Um, this aircraft was overhauled. It could not fly, but it was just something the, the, the students put together um, to you know, demonstrate their skills. Um, Engines, obviously, got to learn about that. And again, you have to teach them about engines. You can see in the background the, 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 the posters from the war encouraging people to, to buy bonds to support the war effort. And of course, we got old Martin MB-1 bombers uh, that were obsolete, obviously, by this point. But this became another way uh, to help our students to learn how to engage and engine maintenance and, and things like that. Um, there were times complaints from locals about all the noise that was being produced by these different facilities where Embry-Riddle was either training people or was uh, actually actively uh, building wings and so forth. And John Paul Riddle got mad and he basically said, look, it's this or the Nazis, make up your mind. So. Uh, and in fact, uh, during the war, we're going to have to um, hire a number of women to come in and uh, because men are going off of the war and uh, we've got aircraft that we, we're flying at these different airfields and they're going to be crack ups and things like that. And we needed people to rebuild wings and, and, and so forth. And and so women just came in and they took over that that part of, of, of the war effort. And we'll see this in many of our fields. It'll be women who run the tower, who run the field, uh, who are d doing a lot of the work of the, as mechanics and things like that as a part of supporting the war effort. Also in the case of someone like uh, this woman, her husband had been a radio operator on a merchant vessel that was sunk by a German U-boat. He dies and she came to Riddle because she wanted to be a, a radio operator and, um, and, and she wanted to, uh, to be a part of the war effort. Um, so um, they would, obviously they would learn Morse code, uh, how to send using a, um, a CW key, and they would learn other uh, forms of, of communication. And again, because John Paul Riddle was huge into athletics, um, for about a year or so, Don Budge, the first American to win uh, tennis's Grand Slam, was our athletic director. And um, he would go to our fields and he would work with the cadets. In this case, you're seeing British cadets and I'll talk more about them later, but but he will go and, you know, because he's a big tennis star, but, but it was more than just tennis. John Paul Riddle wanted the cadets involved in all types of, and it's not just him obviously, because the Air, Army, Army Air Forces would clearly want to see their cadets staying in shape, but but it also came back from John Paul Riddle that he he wanted he he remembered what it was like to be a cadet in the 1920s, and he wanted these cadets to have a better life as a cadet than what he had. Um, now it's 1942, and we're being asked to take over or to build another field. We go all over the South, and eventually John Paul Riddle selects uh, a field near Union City, Tennessee. And uh, I've never been to this field. I've never been to Union City. And uh, I have no idea uh, what the field is like today. But at any rate, um, we build this field and uh, the, it's gonna be like all of our other fields, I think that with the exception that there is no swimming pool for obvious reasons. 
but uh, very similar to our other operations. One other difference between the training at this field and others was that um, we, in addition to the PT-17 Stearman, we had the PT-19 Fairchild. And cadets obviously preferred to flying the Fairchild because they didn't like the biplane. They felt like, I'm not gonna be flying a biplane when I finish you know, with my flight training. And they, they preferred the low wing model aircraft. Uh, that they, they, they preferred to fly this because it reminds them of, well, maybe I'll be flying a P-51, whatever. So they love to fly this plane. In fact, um, several cadets uh, I interviewed years ago uh, who later on became bomber pilots, um, including one that was shot down. He wrote a book about his experience of getting him and his guys uh, out of enemy territory into friendly territory. But uh, I, I remember one of them talked about they would uh, do touch and goes in front of a bridge. And when I mentioned that to one of these guys, um, it really sparked some memories. And he actually sent me a, a map of the entire bridge and show how they would land in front of the bridge, do a touch and go and, and pull out. Unfortunately, one day they were doing some something and one of them hit a power line, knocked out the power for a local town. And so the, the mechanic said, okay, we don't need, we don't, we really don't want you to do that anymore, but we will modify the carburetors on these aircraft. So if you wanna, you know, if you wanna fly upside down, do something like that, we'll help you out. But uh, back off some of this other stuff you're doing and, and causing all kinds of, uh, of a ruckus. For a brief time, the Army Air Forces required our aircraft, not just our aircraft, all aircraft uh, in the Southeast area and maybe other areas to be painted silver. And uh, we had no issues, but in other areas, there were actually accidents, uh, mid-air collisions, because it was difficult for cadets uh, to see another aircraft against the sky if it was silver. So, Eventually, the order was given to go back to painting the aircraft yellow and blue like this to make it easier to see. Uh, by the way, all these photographs you're seeing, um, if you've ever remember the, the photograph of the, uh, the guy sitting on an I-beam over New York City, um, he was our main photographer. His name is just kind of blanking on me right now, but at any rate, uh, he, he lived in Florida. He would travel in the Everglades with his cameras and, um, he, and he became our top photographer. And these photographs that are all being taken in, in color uh, were taken by him. And eventually he settled in Ormond uh, Beach and um, his family has allowed us to, to use his photographs, um, at least those that were not marked in brutal. But um, uh, he was our main photographer. The students also needed to learn how to fly instruments. And one of the early forms of, of this type of training was used or done using the link trainer. And this is where the cadet would climb inside what looks like a little miniature aircraft and they would close it up. And then they're gonna get um, signals from these different operators and they're gonna have to fly a certain path based on, the only other way to do this kind of training was to actually hood the outside of an aircraft and fly it in the sky. Now, Jimmy Doolittle had demonstrated that in the late 1920s. He got a PhD at MIT and he flew a, he flew hooded and he's getting, um, I believe Morse code signals that are telling him when to turn left, when to turn right. And he was able to take off and land, but that was dangerous. In fact, uh, during the war, uh, four of our students were flying in a hooded aircraft over Miami when they collided with another aircraft carrying um, uh, a guy in the army and his, and, and his brand new wife. They were newlyweds. They collide and everyone is killed. This is safer. Um, even though I, I, there were people that I interviewed that said that they really didn't like flying or, or like sitting in these link trainers. Um, you know, here's another photograph you can see. There's the instruments. Uh, the cadet's going to be given instructions and he's going to try to go through the motions of flying an aircraft based on, on instruments. Uh, but uh, a couple of these guys that I was able to interview told me that it, it, it paid off in the end when they were flying B-17s and B-24s uh, out of the UK. Uh, when they got into bad weather, they, they said that this training really paid off at that time. And of course, uh, there's the swimming pool. And um, 
not only was it there for people to enjoy uh, as they could, particularly on weekends, but um, it became a tradition that uh, if any cadet soloed, they would get dunked into the swimming pool. Unfortunately, on one occasion, a cadet got dunked and he didn't come back up. He drowned. I uh, don't know what happened, but uh, that only happened on one occasion. But otherwise, the swimming pool was there uh, for the cadets to enjoy as much as possible, particularly living in Florida. As I said earlier, women play a key role on these airfields. Um, they're on the flight line. Uh, they're, they're in the control tower talking to the cadets. Uh, because again, the men are off at war in different ways. And, and so women are hired to, to come in and, and take over a lot of functions uh, for the company during the war. In Miami, because um, <clears throat> It is now called the War Training Service. Uh, cadets will continue to be trained. Uh, the difference though is that now it's only men who will be trained, not women. And um, Miami would continue to provide the ground school training. We would provide the um, uh, flight training. Um, the field that we use doesn't exist, but it was called Chapman Field. It uh, located in Coral Gables and uh, had another one of these old World War One fields, and we take over it. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I talked to one of the sons, he's gone now, but uh, of John McKay, and I mentioned something about that after the war, uh, Embrito thought about actually buying this whole field, and he, and he couldn't believe it. He said, I hated that field. He said, you, you pull out on the flight line, and you'd be sitting here ready to take off, and all of a sudden you have this sensation that you're moving. And it was because there were hundreds of these blue crabs would go walking across the, the runway. And he said you'd run over them and it stunk. And so he hated that place. But I told him, I said, no, there, there are records that show that your, your mother and father wanted to buy this and, and turn this into a, a major uh, uh, flight line for Embrittle. Um Doesn't happen, but anyway, they were interested. Um, we've got all types of aircraft, mostly biplanes. The instructors will consist of men and women both. Um, several of these women that I, uh, that I was able to interview years ago, I asked one of them, I said, you know, um, how was it when you had to do, and, and this, when you see V5, uh, there was a Navy program in which the Navy said, all right, we want to see if someone is capable of being a pilot before we actually give them primary, basic and advanced training as a part of the Navy. And um, so this was like a pre-flight program and it was supposed to save money. And these, these male and female instructors, they would get like five cadets and I was interviewing one of them and I said, okay, how did you overcome you know, any attitudes toward you being a woman? And she said, all I had to do was take my cadet up into the sky, do some spins, do this, do that, figure eights, whatever. And she said, by the time I got back to the ground, I was God. So um, typically the, the cadets got along with their instructors and, uh, and you have to, it's amazing that we're able to do this because the country is at war, but uh, fortunately there's, uh, there's enough peace that we can engage in this type of instruction uh, during the war. Ch uh, so here's some of our instructors. A couple of these only passed away here in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, but, uh, um, and some of them uh, were motivated for different reasons, but uh, they helped to provide a flight instruction for our cadets. And many of them went on to have uh, a pretty good careers on their own uh, as pilots. Here's a, a photograph of the flight line at Chapman Field, and you can see those Piper Cubs. Uh, Ruth Norton was in charge of the seaplane base, which stayed in operation during the war. Um, and uh, again, despite the fact we're in the middle of a war, uh, we were able to continue to provide private uh, flight training. And uh, for many years, one of our instructors insisted that we had briefly trained John F. Kennedy. And I knew that he had been posted in Miami at one point during the war because he'd already been in the Pacific, he'd already got the Navy Cross, et cetera. But I, I could never prove uh, that her suggestion until about 10 years ago, a museum in Israel 
uh, announced that it had the flight log for John F. Kennedy, and it showed that he actually had put in, I don't know, a few hours at Miami. And despite the fact that Kennedy had been in the war and was still in the Navy, uh, he still needed permission from his mother to uh, come to uh, our seaplane base and, and do the flight training. And in the flight book, there is is her signature, Ethel, Ethel Kennedy. Uh, but our instructor remembered him driving up and going and getting some flight training, but he didn't put in that many hours because eventually the Navy is going to transfer him out, but uh, uh, we're still there. And there were a lot of women who came hoping that uh, they would become pilots. Uh, the, you know, there was obviously you could work for the fairing service, which used women to fly different types of aircraft from the manufacturer to whatever air base or whatever uh, during the war. And so they'd be flying military aircraft because again, there's a shortage. Uh, we've got a lot of our pilots are overseas and we needed people to move aircraft within the United States. And during the war, we trained uh, RAF cadets. The, well, the British early on wanted the United States to help provide flight training. It's in the middle of a war and then France fell in 1940 and it became impossible to try to provide any flight training in the UK, your, 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 your cadets could be shot out of the sky. Churchill at one point had begged Roosevelt to, to all open up the United States flight training. So in 1941, when the, the US government, uh, basically the Congress passed Lend-Lease Act, inside was language that allowed for us to train uh, pilots. And so the British began to send cadets to the United States they could not wear any insignia. They had to wear a plain uniform. And, uh, and there were several of these British flying training schools that were established, seven or eight. And John Paul Riddle was approached and they scoured Florida and they, and they picked an area near Clewiston and it becomes known as Riddle Field. And if you go there, if you go to Clewiston today, you're gonna to see the American flag and the British flag. Uh, flying side by side, and there is a part of the airport that is dedicated to the British cadets. So this was called Riddle McKay Aero College, number five BFTS. Uh, we had provided training to some British cadets under what was called the Arnold Scheme, and that is where the cadets were trained using American methods. The difference with the BFTS was that this was really an RAF field inside the United States. So everything that was done will be done according to RAF regulations. And there will be a small number of Americans who will train at Riddle Field. And even though they were in the Army Air Force, they had to train as if they were RAF cadets. That's one difference. The other difference is that the British initially used the Volte BT-13 for basic training didn't like it, and so they made a decision. And you can see in the background, um, in Brutal Field, but uh, I just want to let, give people, let's see the BT-13. But uh, ultimately, um, the British will use the Stearman for primary and half the basic and the, the, the AT-6 for the rest of basic and for advanced flight training. So this is the only field uh, during the war that we provide actual advanced training for cadets who will be flying around Florida. And I'll talk about numbers a little bit later. There will be Americans who are trained there as a part of what was called the Yanks and the RAF. These were Americans who wanted, who volunteered to fly for the British and they were trained at uh, Riddle Field. And, and many of the, uh, and, and several of these guys in this photograph were all killed in action in 1943, 44 um, in, in Europe uh, during the war. One other aspect of the war was that we had a close relationship, the United States, with Brazil, and Brazil had plenty of pilots, but it didn't have enough mechanics. And so John Paul Riddle, at Roosevelt's suggestion, goes to Brazil and establishes a technical school, and that building still exists today. Uh, this, If you go to Sao Paulo, you're going to see this building. I think this is the immigration building, but it still has Riddle uh, on the building. And so that's where we provide uh, training to Brazilian cadets who are to become mechanics. And um, I, I don't remember exactly how many we trained, but uh, 
uh, we train a number of them. But already by 1944, because of advances in the Pacific and in Europe, we're beginning to see contraction. 1944, Dorf, uh, uh, the, the, the field in Union City is, is closed down. Uh, and then in 1945, we're gonna see closure of Door and Karlstrom and, we're, and, and, and the British will continue training, I think through August or September and then all that is, is, is shut down as well. So uh, our contribution uh, by 1944, 26,000 people, most of which were Army and Navy cadets had received flight and technical training under civilian instructors at the five embryo fields and technical school in Miami. We also uh, produced 4,000 civilian trainees who became pilots and technicians. At Carlson Field, we trained 32 classes of Army Air Corps cadets and eight classes of RAF cadets were trained at Carlson. Um, there's something else that uh, many people may not know, and that is that uh, there will be a number of uh, British cadets that will be uh, killed if, in flight training, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But by 1944, nearly 6,000 Army, U.S. Army cadets and nearly um, 950 RAF cadets graduated. Um, 7,500 graduated by June 45 when the field closed. From 1941 to 45, 550,000 hours flying day and night in the PT-17 logged with only one fatality. And I believe that was the an RAF cadet who was flying at night, came in in fog, turned on his lights to try to see the runway, got blinded, and basically tried to land the plane about five feet off the runway. And um, so, because he, he really couldn't see the runway. Uh, I think that was the only fatality at Carlston Field. A door field, 7,000 cadets trained, 400,000 flight hours after two years. Riddle Field, 24 courses of, of, of 1,800 RAF cadets. Um, they're training again because it's primary to advance six months. Of that number, over 1,300 graduated, as did 109 U.S. cadets. Uh, 23 British cadets, though, will be killed during training at Riddle Field. Because Cluiston, during the, uh, during the war had no ground that was deemed to be above sea level. Uh, that will not be determined until the 1950s when the Army Corps of Engineers finally did find some ground. The cadets had to be buried in Arcadia. So if you go to the cemetery in Arcadia, you're gonna see um, the, the plots for 23 British cadets and John Paul Riddle. When he passed away, he asked that half of his ashes be dropped out of an aircraft um, over Biscayne Bay, but he wanted the rest of his, of his ashes to be buried alongside the British cadets. So the company really contracts. And after being, being one of the largest, if not the largest aviation company in the United States, it's back to being this little tiny company and it nearly got wiped out by a hurricane. Um, I can't remember the name of the hurricane, but it landed in uh, Coral Gables in Miami and uh, did significant damage to buildings that we owned uh, and aircraft that we had. And uh, not just aircraft at Chapman Field, but like many locals in the area, we moved a lot of our planes into the, um, to the uh, blimp hangar that was built by the Navy. Um, and all these planes were put in the building and during the storm, a fire broke out and all the aircraft that were put inside of this building were destroyed. And there's not much, not much left of the hangars. Uh, this, this, these were built in 1942, huge hangars and they're all destroyed. And the problem was it, it came down to our insurance uh, did the storm cause the fire or did the fire break out during the storm? And our insurance would only pay, I don't remember exactly, but our insurance would only pay us back if it, it was one of these circumstances, but not both. And so we stood to lose all the money that we invest in aircraft. This could have been the death of Embrutal. Fortunately for us, the insurance company found in our favor and um, gave us the money to, to recoup our losses. But otherwise, the, the school just kind of limped along and um, seaplane base stayed in, in, in there for a few more years and it closes. And um, we, John McKay dies in 1950. John Paul Riddle by this point 
has split with the McKays. It was not a very happy parting. Uh, John Paul Riddle went off to try to make money in, in, in South America. It didn't happen, but he did run real airlines for many years. Um, so uh, he does that. John McKay dies. Isabel McKay, the wife, takes over. And uh, Amber Riddle stays in Miami until the early 1960s, uh, 1965, actually. The decision is made to bring Amber Riddle to Daytona Beach. Wow. <laughs> so in that, in that period between the, the end of the war and the mid-60s when you, when you moved to Daytona, so it was really just sort of a, a small flight school at the time, right? Yes. And yeah. we had the White Elephant. We still had the main mm -hmm. administration building. But our biggest problem was we had to bus the students all the way out to Tamiami, which is where Florida International University is today. And that was like 45 minutes. And in the late, and, and at one point we had a field and the Navy kicked us out of the, uh, at Opelaka. We had a field in Opelaka, but the Korean War came along and they kicked us out of that. And so we moved to Tamiami and but again, we're busing students 45 minutes just so they can do the flight training. And then we, we find out, well, Tamiami is going away and, and we would have to bust them even further. And um, Jack Hunt, who was a Navy uh, balloonist and had received a medal from Eisenhower in, in the 1950s for carrying out a, a long range uh, dirigible flight over the ocean, was brought on to be president. And he said, I agree to be president, but you got to get out of here. You're in Miami, but you're surrounded by all these other schools and you're going to die. And I'll, I'll be president, but you have to make a decision. You've got to move because you're not going to survive. Um, and so that's, that's became the genesis of this, this genesis of this thinking of, okay, we're going to move. Where are we going to go? And they looked at sites all over Florida. They even looked, I think at sites in Georgia. Uh, but ultimately they made the decision uh, to move to Daytona Beach. Yeah. Wow. And then th from that move, uh, flight training continued to uh, train mechanics, eventually air traffic controllers. And, and now uh, the, uh, the area that you're in charge of with uh, some of the security issues and things, what are some of the other uh, branches that have, that have sort of sprung up from this original tree uh, for uh, Embry-Riddle? Well, we, we had engineering, you know, you know, by this point, you needed aeronautical engineers. And so even in the 60s, we we're producing engineers. But that because one reason why we moved to Daytona Beach was because obviously uh, the space race and we wanted to be a part of uh, what they called um, um, the space triangle. I forgot exactly how to because, you know, GE had a, a factory here in Daytona Beach and there was work being done in Orlando. And then, of course, you have the Cape. And so we begin, we begin to offer aerospace engineering and that became civil on and on. Um, obviously in the College of Aeronautics, you're doing flight training, you're doing, uh, we, have, we train uh, people to be mechanics, you have your ATC, um, but they've had, uh, they had, you know, meteorology on and on. So they had, but we eventually added a college of business and some of that had its genesis maybe in the 1950s, but uh, it took a long time, but eventually we, we do have this college of business. And um, at some point in the 70s and returning in the 1990s, early 2000s, the decision was made to have a college of arts and science. And that houses our math department, um, our physical sciences department, which now has astronomy um, because we have the tallest telescope in the state of Florida. Uh, human factors, which um, obviously is focused on researching what it, what happens to the pilot when they're in an aircraft, but we also added um, aerospace physiology for people who wanted to go into the medical field. And then you have my department, which is devoted to security studies. So um, over time, we, we realized we had to build other programs because we can only train but so many engineers and we can only train but so many pilots per year. We don't have the capacity. But if we're going to survive as an institution, we need to have uh, our, you know, we need to be educating students and other things. And so we saw that we have about 7,500, 8,000 students. So they're not all here to be pilots, but they like being in this type of an environment. Excellent. Well, we're going to turn things over now to uh, our audience and get some uh, questions that I'm, I'm sure uh, those of you who've been watching have uh, probably come up with a couple of questions. So we'll uh, turn over to our live uh, Q&A session. And uh, so stand by for that. 
All right. Looks like we are, are back. Dr. Kraft, thank you for uh, all that information that uh, you provided for us. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that uh, that have come in. Um, I, one that, that struck me is uh, when, when you had the uh, the civilian uh, air route, uh, CAM 2024, 20, was it? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you took passengers. How much was a ticket? I don't remember off the top of my head what a ticket would have cost. Um, that's something probably I should know because it's something that I've uh, written about or talked about in class years ago, yeah. uh, what would be a standard ticket. Uh, I remember from the barnstorming days, I've seen tickets as much like $5 just for one person to go for a ride. But yeah. to make that trip, um, I can't say off the top of my head for sure how much we charged. Okay. And and, and one thing that, uh, that I looked up while, while we were uh, on air is uh, the Ford Trimotor. There are 199 of those uh, built uh, by Ford. And uh, it, depending on how they were configured, some were just cargo carriers and others were, were for passengers, anywhere from eight to 17 passengers. So there you go. <laughs> I, yeah, it's I, still like our, I don't know. It's been many years. It's probably been 18 years since I've flown in one. <laughs> and um, um, I couldn't remember exactly how many people we, we had on that plane. Uh, but um, and that was an interesting aircraft. Um, yeah. Obviously, you put your suitcases in the back. I think the lavatory was consist of a, a hole in the floor. That's something I've read, but uh, it would have been pretty simple if, uh, for those times. Yeah. Although in 1929, that was uh, that was cutting edge, and the, and were actually some of them were were billed as the first transcontinental uh, flights, which consisted of flying from New York. Yeah, I don't remember how far they went, but they ended up landing at dark, getting on a train, going to the next station, picking up. <laughs> yeah, Transcontinental Railroad kind of kind of put that out of yeah, business. Yeah, that was the old TAT. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, and we also talked about the uh, the famous uh, photo, and I've got it here for us. Yeah, I think. There we go. Are you seeing it now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, and uh, Charles Clyde Ebbets is the photographer credited with that. And uh, you said uh, he, he's, uh, his archives are, are pretty extensive, uh, not only uh, photographic work like this, but also for, uh, for Amber Riddle. Yeah, because again, he was our chief photographer and every photograph that he took, he would stamp on the back, Charles C. Ebbets uh, photo. <laughs> uh, so with those we own, but uh, uh, graphs that were in uh, that I'm that I use for this presentation that's owned by the family yeah. um, um, and they've given us permission to use them uh, publications and things like that excellent uh, one of our uh, viewers was asking uh, and this is uh, door field near Arcadia as it looks today in uh, Google Earth uh, so it did very similar to uh, to as it did in the in the uh, the training days. Although if you, you zoom in, you can see the uh, you can see the security fence going around it. But uh, the question was, what what was the purpose of the the uh, the roadway that goes around the entire facility? Was that the were, were those the runways? The, no, 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 no. That was just for automobiles. Okay. So um, at Carlstrom, it was just a big circle. Okay. And, and uh, I meant to say this in my presentation, but when I was there in 2002, a security guard comes up to me and says, who are you? What are you doing here? And all I said, well, I'm, I'm with Embryo. Oh, really? My granddaughter is a, is a steward in Embryo. It's so nice to meet you. But no, that was the purpose of the, the road was simply for automobiles to pass, probably for supply trucks to be able okay. to come in and drop things. Why the architect, um, Stefan, something or other, he's from Miami. Why he, you know, went from a circle to this type of oblong diamond shape, what do you want to yeah. call it? I don't know why he, why he did it that way, but he just, maybe just as an architect, he wanted to be different. But those are roads okay. to be used for automobiles and so forth. Okay. Where were they? Do you know where the actual runways were in relation to what we're looking at? I'm assuming because if you look to the left of this photograph, you can see those big squares. Those were the hangars. Oh, so okay. the runways would have been even from that. On the far right of the photograph is as about as, as close as I could get in 2002. Sure. Uh, that's the main road that goes right by it. And um, uh, but but basically to the left of of, of the, the oval or or whatever you want to call it, you could see still see what used to be the foundation for hangars, and the runway would have been 
further over from that. Okay. Um, one of our uh, viewers is wondering, um, is there a reason that was ever, uh, I guess, uh, figured out for why more British cadets uh, passed away in flight training than uh, American cadets? Um, I, I don't think there was a particular reason okay. other than um, maybe it was because I'd have to go back and look at were they killed doing the steermans or were they killed mm -hmm. flying AT6s? Okay. Because I know even our own cadets, they love to, and even some of the instructors, love to play with the prop pitch on that aircraft and and go fly you know low over homes and, and one instructor his wife he would go over and, and all that i do recall though we did lose one cadet because on the night of um when germany surrendered mm -hmm. um you probably know in florida they had german pow camps yeah. and one of the cadets as a way of celebrating victory, kind of dived on the camp, but for whatever reason, lost control of the plane and he was killed. Hmm. So uh, I don't know, you know and we, we had a few cadets go down in the Everglades, but typically we we're able to get them. They hmm. might have to spend the entire night in the Everglades. And by the time we got there, uh, they'd been eaten up pretty good by mosquitoes and everything else. Uh, but Floridians had these very interesting buggies that would go out into the water and collect these guys. But that's that's a good question. I I don't know that the uh, I've, I've you know I remember some of the reasons why the cadets died in training. But um, and I was wrong. I, I shouldn't say there should there should be 24 British plots. One cadet died at Carlstrom. 23 died in Riddle Field. And then they, there should be a, a group of 25, and that would include John Paul Riddle. Okay. Um, how did so uh, American Airways or bought the uh bought Embry Riddle early on, right? And but then it's reborn. How did you get the name <laughs> Embry Riddle back from from American? That's a story that we don't know. Oh. Um that's one of the problems that we have as an institution is that a lot of records for the 20s were lost. Mm -hmm. And uh and also a lot of our records for the war were lost because of the hurricane. Um and so um, and, and even there's, uh, there's some, we really are not sure exactly how the Lehman brothers, for example, even forced the merger the way that they did. <clears throat> it's always been a question about, you know, how, what was going on behind the scenes, but how John, you know, how John Paul Riddle maintained or somehow got back his name. That's a good question. And I don't know if it's because American Airways didn't care, uh, whatever the reason, but um, somehow he, we got our, it got the name back. Um, I know that Jack Hunt wanted to drop the name. He even wanted to call us either something like um, Florida Aeronautical University, something like Florida West Point. <laughs> he had all kinds of ideas. Um, and from time to time, there, there, there has been talk about, okay, we're now in the space age. Why don't we call ourselves um, Embry-Riddle Aerospace University? Mm -hmm. And typically there's been pushback, but at the end of the day, if you're gonna do that, it's gonna cost a lot of money because every legal document that you've yeah. ever signed is gonna have to be done over. And, and but, but that's a very good question and I wish that I, I could have an answer for that because I don't know how Riddle kept his name. And, and, and again, Embry uh, apparently didn't care. He moved to LA, he right. got into boats. And 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 I, as far as I know, Embry, I, we don't even know if Embry even received money uh, because it's Riddle McKay, but we don't even know if they had like a side contract with him to say, okay, we've got your name and we're gonna give you a cut. We have no information about that. Crazy. Uh, speaking of, of history, is there an archive that uh, people can visit uh, at the university or online that would tell more of these stories? Yes, uh, we have our, in our library, we have a librarian who has been dedicated uh, and basically we're trying to digitize a lot of our materials. Uh, one of the sad things is that there used to be a lot of records, for example, from regarding the the BFTS in Clewiston, and but when I was there years ago, 
it wasn't really treated it had ac but not the ac that you need for running a museum mm -hmm. and um and some of our folks who were going down began to realize that some stuff was disappearing so one of the things we're trying to do is not only digitize our own archive uh but try to digitize um things that are there and we just recently had um, a family for an american who was sent to um Riddlefield, who trained with the British, but obviously he flew for the Army Air Forces. And there are all these letters, and the family bequeathed them to us, and we're going to digitize those. Uh, actually, they're, they already be digitized. Yeah. So um, what we're doing is we're working on having a system in which you could go online and do a search for photographs and so forth. And um, uh, I believe you could put in a request uh, to a lot to our particular librarian who's dedicated uh, to protecting the archive and collecting anything else because we still will get things from time to time uh, from people who were trained by Emeril at some point during the war. Good. Uh, is your book uh, still available? Yes, it is. You can go to Amazon.com and just look up Emeril War, and um, it's there. I think it's like twenty-four bucks. <laughs> okay. Good. And what's the uh, the main website address for uh, university? It would be E R A U uh, Echo Romeo Alpha Uniform dot edu. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight and uh, being a part of this. It's uh, it, it had, until uh, Bart Graham uh, suggested this, I had no idea that uh, Ember Riddle was involved in in flight training during World War II. But now that you tell the story, it, it makes so much sense. I should have known that myself. But I'm going to thank you for for uh, your wealth of knowledge and uh, and uh, appreciate you uh, spending time with us tonight. Thank you for having me. All right. And for those of you watching, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to click that like, subscribe, or follow button, and we can let you know about our future shows. As always, if you have ideas for a topic, an aircraft you'd like to hear more about, or an interesting story like this from Embry Riddle, just like, uh, just drop Leah Black an email at media at cafhq.org. Thank you again, Dr. Kraft. And until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Good night.